Views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of Blue Ridge PBS, the Virginia Department of Education, or the Virginia Society for Technology and Education. Blue Ridge PBS, in partnership with the Virginia Department of Education and in collaboration with VISTI, the Virginia Society for Technology and Education, is talking to leading educators about what gets them energized and how technology is being used to inspire student engagement. This is Activated Learning. Do you remember teachers, good or bad, who really influenced the way that you teach now? I had one really great teacher. Um, Mr. Ziegler was my government and economics teacher. And like he just gave us assignments that um, were just things in the real world. Welcome to Activated Learning. I'm Tom Landon, Director of Educational Innovation for Blue Ridge PBS, and today we traveled to South Lakes High School in Reston, Virginia, to talk to Emily Burrell, a fantastic math teacher who's a finalist for the 2023 Presidential Award for Excellence in Math and Science Teaching. The annual award recognizes educators who develop and implement high-quality instructional programs that improve student learning in math and science. Emily, welcome to Activated Learning. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And I know this is a little strange in terms of, you know, a, a conversation to have with microphones in front of you and everything, but but I'm so grateful that you said yes to letting us learn more about you and, and your teaching. You know, the whole purpose of this podcast is to kind of elevate the the profession of teaching and, and to help other teachers who you may never meet, you mm-hmm. know, learn from you. So that um, I just want to start by, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, where did you come from and, and what led to you becoming a teacher? I grew up outside of Philadelphia um, and I always liked math. I studied math in college and then I graduated and I didn't really know what I wanted to do next. So I did a few different things. Um, I worked for Head Start. I um, I worked um, I actually did an administrative job in New York at a magnet school, and then I worked as a pre-K teacher in D.C., and I finally decided, like, I really do enjoy working with those very young people, but I wanted to try um, incorporating my math degree and teaching high school. So I went back to school and um, got my first job in Arlington County. Do you remember teachers, good or bad, who really influence the way that you teach now? When, when you think back to, to people who you interacted with in schools, you know, what do you recall? Is there a certain person? As a student, I had one really great teacher. Um, Mr. Ziegler was my government and economics teacher. And like he just gave us assignments that were just things in the real world. His assignments were things like volunteer in a political campaign. And so um, I wasn't really like a very worldly kid, but I just got on the subway and went into Philadelphia and I did that. Um, And I did it because like he said I could, like he said that that's something that I could do. Um, And so that was great. Some of my math teachers, some of them just weren't as good in that way. They um, would stand at the chalkboard and write out um, solutions to problems for us to copy. And, you know, I was a pretty good student. I was polite and I copied them down. But that's not where my learning happened because I wasn't doing any of the work. As a social studies person myself, I'm always, you know, I know why I decided to teach social studies because it's the thing I'm interested in. How about math? What was it about math? You know, what is it about math that you like and like sharing with students? I think in high school, I liked it as a puzzle, like to figure things out. I like the challenge of it. And I mean, I, I like the abstract math, but I also like working with kids to let them see like how the math actually does apply to their real life. Was there any kind of math? I mean, obviously you're, you, you love math. Was there a kind of math that gave you trouble when you were coming up? Pretty sure that there was in college. I don't remember which they were, though, because it was so long ago. I know now um, I've taught through honors pre-calculus and like IB year one. But like once my own son got past those courses, I I was not the one helping him anymore. (laughs) That's such a parent's thing, right? Mm -hmm. And and, and a lot of parents hopefully will listen to this. And and, and I think... um, parents think, especially math teachers, but science teachers and other of the more, you know, um, kind of, I don't know, practical subjects, I guess. Um, parents assume that all of this always came easy to everyone. Mm-hmm. And then here you are talking about when your own children were in mm-hmm. school, you let the, you, you kind of had to let the teachers do the teaching. Right. right. 
You've been, a, you're a finalist at the, at the time of this recording, you're a finalist for the 2023 Presidential Award for Excellence in Math and Science Teaching. Um, it is a, a big honor, but most teachers don't really think about awards. What's it, been, what's it been like for you to go through the nomination process? And also, what would it mean? You know, what would be good about winning? Oh, <laughs> Um, I mean, it's, it's just been very validating, you know, to have your work recognized like this. And I didn't really know that I would ever in my career be recognized for my work because there are so few um, awards and so many excellent teachers out there. Uh, so I, you know, I was prepared to go through it without it, but I guess it's just it's a nice celebration of the work that I've done and the years I've put in. Sure, sure. Um, I read something that you wrote for Education Week, which was beautifully written, by the way. And and you talk about um, you talk about teaching high school math to kids who've been marginalized by the education system. Um, what's your approach to that when when a student comes to you and you might be teaching uh, in Virginia? We have algebra functions and data analysis, mm-hmm. which can kind of be a catch all subject for some schools. Um, when a kid comes to you and it's clear that they have not a love for math, we'll just say it that way, mm-hmm. what's the approach to reaching those kids? Well, a lot of times um, kids don't love math because like, they might feel embarrassed in that class or they just might feel frustrated with it. And so, and they might not feel like it, it means anything to them. Um, and so, and algebra functions and data analysis, when Fairfax County started to reoffer the course, they had shut it down for a few years. And when they started to reoffer the course, um, I worked with some other teachers over the summer to build the curriculum for it. And we built projects as assessments. So it's not completely project based learning, but it's um, project assessments. And so uh, the students demonstrate their learning in this way. They build a project. Um, they make a lot of choices in their project so that they can choose subjects that are interesting to them or relate to their life. And they become really invested in their work because of that. And what, are, what are some examples of some projects that kids have done that have kind of – you went, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I'm hoping for. So their their first project of the year is to um, – to advertise a function machine that will solve a problem. And so the kids, like, they brainstorm and they think of some really interesting problems. Like one student said, when I walk to work at night, there's no lights. And it's because the community, um, you know, wants the, um, like, light-free. Uh, and But that's hard for him as he's walking to work at night. And so that was a solution. Um, he, you know, he created a function that would add a certain number of lights for each, like, mile of that he walked to work. And and, and they use, you know, they do uh, the traditional function learning there. You know, they talk about the domain and range of their function and how that would apply in the real world. They um, describe their function with graphs and tables and equations. And um, th- and they build an advertisement for their function, too. And they talk about, like, how their function works as an actual function um, and how a competitor might not be a genuine function where every input doesn't have one output. So they really um, – they they cover a lot of material, but in the course of something that's um, interesting to them. And, you know, practical math, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's the kind of math we use in our daily lives anyway. One of the things that you wrote also in that article is that um, sometimes at the beginning of a year, you don't really do a lot of math. Sometimes for a, like two weeks of the school year, mm-hmm. there's so much pressure on us as teachers to get right to the content and start crossing those SOLs off. What, what does it do for you to, to take that time to set up your year, to set up your semester? So it's important to get to know the students. It's important to be able to greet the students by name and, you know, look them in the eye as they enter the classroom. And so, you know, that, that's definitely a priority. Um, it's also important to kind of set the standards that we're going to be working with. So, you know, expecting their active engagement in class and um, giving them things to start their year off with that might be have like really low entry points so that they can enter it at whatever level they're at. And th- they might have some math in those activities, but they're not usually like the standards for the course. They're, um, they're just math related to get them, you know, to start thinking in mathematically probably also helps you get to, you know, it's an informal Mm pre-assessment, right, for you to see where they are. 
what does success look like for your students to you? Um, success for every student is different. Um, this year I'm teaching the algebra functions and data analysis. I'm teaching a regular algebra two class and I'm teaching an IB, um, mathematics applications class too. Um, and even within those classes, success is different for every student. But, um, I want every student to feel capable of doing math. And so that's really a first priority. And I want them to push themselves. So, you know, I have to kind of learn, like, what can they do already? And how, where can I push them? You know, there's like that zone and you, you can't push them too much um, and you can't push them too little or they think that you don't believe in them. What role does sort of having to differentiate your instruction for lots of people? And I'm going to ring my bell. This is my buzzword bell because okay. <laughs> I just said a differentiation, which you and I know what that is. But mm. um First of all, how would you describe what it is to to design that? And also, like, what role does that have to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to learn? The best way to differentiate, you know, rather than um, building different lessons for every kid is to have a lesson that's open so that a student um, who is just starting to understand the material can approach it in one way and a student who has a more solid grasp can approach it another way. And like in... One way projects are really good for that because a student, they'll, they'll be a rubric and a student will know what's expected of them, but a student who wants to delve more deeply can do a little more. Um, I think a lot of teachers will do a project where a student will make a picture out of um, graphs. And so, you know, you can do a very simple picture and still like fulfill most of the rubric items, or you can really like expand on that because you got really into it. Um, like one of my students found the character that they wanted to build um, from a video game that they like, and it took a really long time, but he did it. Do your kids tend to understand, I mean, when students are submitting their work or turning in their work and one student has done what for them is a lot of work, mm -hmm. but, um, is not the same as your high flyer might do in that same project. How do you, do you ever come up against sort of their strong sense of unfairness and justice? And if you do, what, how do you, how do you deal with that? I think the kids try really hard to do work that they're proud of. Like they've created a product and they want to be proud of their work. And so for some kids, you know, just fulfilling the minimum requirements of the rubric, they're proud because they did what was asked of them. And for some kids, they know they can do more. And so they want to do that too. My students don't really like ask me about other students' grades. And so, um, and we, we try not to focus on the grades. I mean, obviously like there are reasons why some students focus on their grades more than others, but but we just, we try to focus on like what we're learning instead of like anything that might be fair or unfair. This is Activated Learning from Blue Ridge PBS in partnership with the Virginia Department of Education and in collaboration with Visti. If you like what you hear, subscribe to Activated Learning wherever you get your podcasts. If you've got an idea for an upcoming show, let us know at Activated Learning at BlueRidgePBS.org. You're listening to Activated Learning. I'm Tom Landon. I'm so happy to be joined by Emily Burrell at, here at South Lakes High School. Uh, and, uh, and, and thank you again for, for taking time on a Friday afternoon <laughs> to talk to me. I want to leave talking about your interaction with students and, and their performance to talk a little bit more about you. Um, teaching is hard, and it's becoming increasingly hard to find good math teachers and certainly to keep good math teachers. What do you do in your own life to try to, A, keep it fresh, but also outside of school to just make sure you're turning it off? Keeping it fresh is very important to me. I mean, um, I'm just always learning. I'm, I'm learning from my students, and but I'm learning in other ways too. Um, in Fairfax County, we have a group called Secondary Math Instructional Leaders, and we meet monthly um, we uh, we read the book Building Thinking Classrooms together, which is really like one of my newest passions um, because there there's really so much that you can do there. Like you can't do the whole book in one year. And then – and I read other books as well. I actually – I was so interested in education policy that I went back to school just a couple years ago to study education policy. 
Okay, but that and that's great. Yes, but that's all very work related. Yes. So, okay, so I'll talk about that too. I thought. I thought. Yes, no, I understand. No, it's, it's all. It's all good. Mm -hmm. It's just. I. Um, How do I do things I mean, outside of work? Right. Right. Okay. Just to take care of yourself. Yeah. It's hard because um, as a teacher, there's like always something else that should be done. Um, you can work sixty to seventy hours a week, and there's still more things that should be done. So it's it's hard to like set that time aside. I think. Um, what you have to do is just have something outside of work so that there's something else you have to do. <laughs> you know, you can have a family, you can have a friend family, um, you can have a pet, you can have a hobby, but you need to um, make time for something else on your calendar so that, um, so that you're not only working all the time. <laughs> right. And in addition to reading those great professional development mm -hmm. books, it's good to have a, you know, a novel or something else that you can read, right? I read a lot. Yeah. And we have, um, we have a book club at our school. Um, and I have a personal book club as well. And so, um, I'm always reading for those. When we spoke originally on the phone, um, I think one of the things you said was like, you know, it sounds like this is a lot about instructional technology and this podcast does often focus on mm -hmm. instructional technology, but that's not all it is. And you were a little hesitant to you're like that's I, the technology isn't really the core of what i do mm -hmm. um but are there some are there some technologies that you incorporate into your classroom and 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 how does that work in this room well desmos has been a real game changer for math teachers just because it's so easy to interact with okay and i'm gonna ring my little bell again and just say <laughs> desmos what is desmos for those who are not <laughs> math teachers because a lot of our folks are not Desmos is an online graphing calculator. It's um it's free and um and they actually they're just coming out with a 3D Desmos. I think it's in a beta version right now. But it's really in easy to interact with. So when students are like investigating equations or graphs and um and you know I when I was in high school maybe I would have had to graph those by hand. Even a few years ago, graphing calculators were there. Which have always mystified me, by the way, because uh -huh. I didn't grow up with them either. I remember my children bringing home a graphing calculator, right. and one of them wanted some help with it. I'm like, I, I'm no help there. Yeah, and I mean, graphing calculators are a great tool, but there are several steps to using them. And Desmos, if you like wonder to yourself, oh, I wonder what the maximum of this function is, just like in order to answer your next question, you can look on Desmos, you can click the uh, maximum of the function, and you you know right away what it is. Um, and so... So Desmos has been really helpful for students just to, in their own investigations. And then um, I use their site, like the, the teacher Desmos site too, where there are a lot of interactive activities that um, kids can answer and I can follow their work on a teacher dashboard. So that's probably the main thing I use. Um, I use our school's Schoology platform and that's really good for keeping kids up to date on what's like going on in class. And if they miss a day, they can get their notes there. Um, it's good for parents to understand what's going on too. Are there, you know, are there people in the school, whether it's coworkers or maybe instructional technology resource teachers or coaches or things who you've leaned on? And, and if not, that's fine. But are there folks that you, you know, you can go to for help when you need mm -hmm. it? Yeah, we've had a really great school-based um, technology specialist at our school. And I mean, she does like a lot of general outreach through like weekly emails and we, she does trainings and we have um, school days, um, but she's also like somebody that you can reach out to. And unfortunately she just got a promotion, so we'll be getting a new one, but I'm sure that they'll be good too. But that's like a really useful thing to have in your school. And um, I also work with my collaborative teams and, you know, we teach each other things too. When you um, think about new teachers coming in and if you've done some recent coursework in school policy. You've thought about this a little bit, I think. So what kind of advice do you have for, let's start with somebody who just thinks they might want to be a teacher, not mm -hmm. even a pre-service teacher or somebody like that yet, but somebody who's considering that maybe being a teacher would be for them. What would you, what would you tell them to watch out for? To watch out for. Or, or, <laughs> or, or to look forward to. I think they just need to they need to have a positive attitude towards um, kids and like what they can achieve. They really have to believe that every kid can achieve because if you have that mindset, then, you know, the kids will believe it too. To watch out for, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that it's fair to warn them that there are a lot of hours um, that work can be really demanding. And I, I think that I would make sure that they had a good mentor teacher 
and that, you know, they're, they're spending time with the teachers that hold those same beliefs as them, you know, instead of with teachers um, that may be more jaded. That is so, I mean, I remember um, some great advice I got as a new teacher and it was from a, a great principal, Willie Waker, Willie Waker, who was my educational hero. And he said to me, he said, now, Tom, you're going to come in here. I want you not to spend very much time in the teacher's lounge. <laughs> and the teacher's lounge can be a great place. But yeah. for that first six months or so, I mm-hmm. tried to do my interactions with other teachers on, you know, kind of one-on-one. Did you, do you feel that too? And I know the teacher's lounges aren't what they used to be. It used yeah. to be a place where you'd teachers would go in and smoke their cigarettes. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a lot different now, but um, you know, what do you think about and when you talk about being around positive people, how do you kind of do that to find your tribe, your teaching tribe? Uh, I mean, you just have to, you have to try different things at the school. I mean, we have really good camaraderie in our math department, you know, and it really like, you know, builds your spirits. If, you know, if you're having a difficult day that you can go and have lunch with your peers, but I can understand that. Like if you have more jaded peers, that that wouldn't um, be the thing to do, but you know, you, there are so many ways for teachers to get involved in the school too, that like, if you can find that one thing, um, you know, then you, you find people outside of your immediate uh, subject area too, you know, that might be people that you enjoy being around. Well, Emily, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk to me today. And on behalf of everybody at Activated Learning, I just wish you the very, very best as the as you go forward in the presidential award process, but also just as you go through the rest of this school year. Thank you so much. You're welcome. As you heard announcer Jay say at the top of this episode, one of our podcast partners is VISTI, the Virginia Society for Technology and Education. And in December, we spent some time at their annual conference in Roanoke, Virginia, talking to some interesting folks. We'll be sharing these short conversations occasionally on Activated Learning, like this one. We are here in the the lobby at the Hotel Roanoke while the VISTI conference goes on. So if you hear noises behind us, that's what's going on. And I am so excited to talk to Wesi Tindwa from Adobe. And tell me that title again so that everybody else can hear it. Adobe Education Evangelist. That is a great title. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. Um, So uh, tell me what you do for Adobe. So I have the honor and joy of working with a team of educators. We all came from the public school sector and um, we get to serve as liaisons between the um, Adobe products that we are supporting with K-12 instruction and the school districts that are implementing them. So uh, we go in and we work with teachers and school districts in helping them find ways to embed uh, creativity in their day-to-day instruction. I think it's so important that your company has educators. It's You're not just designing an app or a, exactly. or, or a piece of software exactly. or equipment and saying, you know, this is going to be helpful to you in school, right? Yes. So, um, when teachers Mm -hmm. start to integrate a new application or new software, Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you as an education evangelist kind of grease the wheels to make it, because it can be hard and confusing and and difficult for a teacher to, I'm going to do something new now. Absolutely. And I love this question because I'm very passionate about this. Sometimes we give, especially as teachers and educators, we give ourselves limitations that we might not know of. Like, for example, I have to be an expert in this thing before I can impart this on my students or have my students do it. Or, you know, just a sense of um, I'm not good in this field, so maybe I shouldn't be touching that. Or I will use it, but I'm not quite sure if it's really leveraging the... um, the curriculum or the uh, the demand that I have in my instruction, my time, and so uh, I personally love to work with teachers who find themselves in those positions, who might not have a background in in the technologies that we're using, um, because I think it's really, really important that we provide spaces and opportunities for students to hit those highest levels of thinking and for all students. If you are anything like me, Tom, growing up, if you were doing anything creative in instruction, it was if you finished early (laughs) or if you were in art class. 
and it was incredibly limited. Oh, my whole incentive as a student was to get the do- work done so I could read, you know, they would let me read the book I wanted to read. Yes. And that was all it was. It wasn't, I mean, it was this was, you know, 70s. So, but it's just like, I always had a book working and I, all I was thinking about during school was that book. But if I got my math done, the teacher would let me do it. So yeah. I was all about speed to get to what I wanted to do. Right. And it's, um, I, I think that's all also been kind of an association with creativity is that it's something that is, it's more in the interest field as opposed to, you know, educational or that's You've learned what to, you need to learn. Now le- you can do something now fun. Now you can do something fun. Um, and because being creative is and should be inherently fun and so sometimes we don't always associate that with it being academic um, or being something that is actually yielding innovative thinking and preparing our students for um, the world that we want them to live in very richly and abundantly and be able to contribute to and have all of these amazing um, insights going out into the workforce and so uh, our, I, I love our mission. Our mission is to inspire and empower the next generation of lifelong creators. And um, doing this has really opened me up in, in a, working with teachers in a different way to say, you know, we have, um, we have our must-dos and we have our may-dos and how can we really fit into these, these spaces in our curriculum design, in our instructional design to allow all students regardless of what they're coming with, regardless of where they are at in their, in, in their literacy, in, you know, in their math, whatever. Um, but how can we uh, have students really get into this deep level of thinking through creativity, have that creative self-expression, have um, the creative thinking, and be able to reflect on their learning experiences in a really powerful way that inherently allows for student ownership of their learning. Great. And we thank you for coming to Virginia for this conference. When you looked at what was happening here, and I know you're, you're largely spending a lot of time in the vendor area, I but am. what did you come here to learn? So this is actually one of my most favorite conferences. Um, and because I consider myself a Virginia girl, so I love to come here and just see kind of what's fresh and what's top of mind because the, the VISTI conference always provides that. Um, from the keynote speakers to the sessions. I, I actually came here to speak with people who are, just, just like you're doing, who are attending the sessions but also who are leading sessions um, and to get a sense of what is it that is bringing you here, what are you here to talk about and why. So um, in addition to me going into the rooms and seeing some of also who I call our surrogates, folks who are... Um, you know, doing work in schools and presenting on uh, Adobe Express and creativity. I also like to kind of see what else is um, is resonating for teachers and students and what's bringing them to a space like this. And what are you here to share? I'm here to share, well, officially I'm here to share Adobe Express. We, sure. we, <laughs> we have this amazing quick K-12 and obviously I'm partial, but even if I weren't, it is an amazing K-12 um, resource to support teachers with um, helping students both build digital literacy skills and be creative. Um, so we are sharing that and we're also um, just connecting with folks on um, what they're currently doing in instruction, what their needs are and what some what professional development um, requests and demands are on uh, are on their minds and so we've actually had a few people stop by and say hey can you work with our, our schools we've got we've got all of these federated accounts and we um, now we just need to you know know how to use them and integrate them and so that's that's really the the happy point for me is hearing that great thank you so much you're so welcome thanks what for a having pleasure me to actually meet you I know. We've on the phone in so person <laughs> all right. great thanks thanks Tom If you like what you hear, subscribe to Activated Learning on Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Blue Ridge PBS Echo TV. If you've got ideas to share, drop us a note at activatedlearning at blueridgepbs.org. Activated Learning was created by Blue Ridge PBS in partnership with the Virginia Department of Education and in collaboration with the Virginia Society for Technology and Education. Produced by Tom Landon, Director of Educational Innovation at Blue Ridge PBS, with a lot of help from 
graphic and audio designer Jay Prater, podcast studio producers Andy DePew and Kurt Schruth, and vice president of education Dr. Rose Martin. Our theme music was composed and produced by Ryan Champney and Dr. Matt Katatachea of Visti. Copyright 2023, Blue Ridge PBS.